Okay, so we have bulb 3, which is in parallel with everything. I have bulb 1 and 2 in series, and I have a switch that takes bulb 2 out of the circuit when it's closed. That is schematic number 1. That's your schematic of the day number 1. Does anybody have any questions on this schematic? Compare it to what you turned in and see if you can identify your biggest difference. Um, if you want to jot this one down or take a screen print of this, I am going to alter this one a little bit in a minute here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to put it the... It seems a lot of people turned in a very similar schematic that was slightly different. And I want to address that one real quick. But this is the correct one. So if you want to jot it down, I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay. So again, we're talking a switch with a uh, um, path of least resistance. So when I energize service switch 1, okay, so if I have service switch 1 in the closed position, that's SS, service switch. Okay, right now, bulb 1 and 2 are sharing voltage. So these bulbs are going to be slightly dimmer. They're sharing voltage. Um, when I have switch 1 closed, I am no longer, ha the path of least resistance is bypassing bulb 2. So your bulb 1 is going to get the full voltage. If I reopen switch 1, I no longer have a bypass. So the current has to go through both bulbs because the current is the same on any rung of, of, of a series circuit, okay? So current's going through here. There might be a different current going through bulb 3. Voltages are split in this situation between B1 and B2. However, if I just want voltage going to B1, I bypass B2 because the resistance of B2 is now higher than the wire and switch that goes around it. Does anybody have any questions on this, the way it's set up right now? Negative. Nope. Okay. Now, a lot of people did turn in a diagram, and I didn't take points unless you had a short circuit or unless it just totally was wrong or unreadable. I had a couple unreadables. But a couple people turned in a diagram that looked like this. Yeah. Why doesn't this work? Both bulbs 1 and 2 would turn off because they don't have a lead back to neutral. Yeah, because any break in a series circuit is going to prevent the bulbs from working. Just okay. realized that. <laughs> what was that? I just realized that. No, that's what I submitted. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did. So, again, that's why this this would not work. So, again, we have to worry about this bypass. Now, where am I going to use a bypass? Okay, we use it in motor controls. We use it in... Um, in some of our primary control, in other words, some of our oil safeties, we actually use a bypass. So we do use bypasses, and that's why this is important. Now, having it back in your original format here, okay, your next schematic of the day is telling you to basically take this diagram, okay? You're taking this diagram and you're adding a control circuit on it. So to add a control circuit, what's the first component you're going to add? I'm not going to draw it for you guys here, but what's the first component you're going to add? Yeah, we're going to add a transformer. Okay. Then it says you're going to control that, you're going to control this with low voltage switching, right? 
So yes. what do I have to have on the line voltage side instead of switch one or instead of a switch? Uh, the relay, relay contact. The contact. The relay what do I have to have on the control voltage side? The relay coil. And? And a heating thermostat. The, a switch. Thermostat. To satisfy it. Oh, a switch. Yeah. Which, so, same thing, Cody. I, yeah, did, I yeah. put a, did I actually in my description put a thermostat in? No, you just you, you said any other components that we spoke about. But if I put a thermostat in, I mean... I'm not going to take points. I'm not going to take points off for that. It's a, it's a okay. switching device. I'm fine yeah. with that. Yeah. Guys, my goal is not to get you guys on points. Okay, I'm not. That's not what I do. Okay, I actually when I sit here and grade, I actually look for ways not to take points. Okay, but we still have to have some basic knowledge. Like I don't want to see a short. If I see a short circuit in a diagram. I have a tendency to take quite a lot of points, okay, because that just, you guys by now know every branch of a diagram has to have some sort of switch, has to have a load before it connects back to neutral, okay? Short circuits are just something that shouldn't be happening at this point. But if you try a diagram and if it's not 100% correct, I try not to take points unless I spent the time in class going over the specific diagram. Okay, then it just becomes annoying. So if you do a thermostat instead of a switch where there could be a thermostat, I'm fine with that. Never going to take points on that. Okay, what about labeling? Does everybody understand labeling? Yes. Yes. Okay, should I have circuits turned in anymore without things being labeled? No. No. Oh. Probably not. No. Okay, you know, when it was just one light bulb or two light bulbs, you know, I could deal with it a little bit, but the whole thing is we're starting to build more and more complex circuits as we go along, and we've got a label. Okay, so again, schematic is day number two. You're basically taking a similar schematic and you're revising it. We're adding our control circuit, which we're adding a transformer. You're going to add a relay coil. And you're going to add a, um, you're going to add contacts because I know because I can't control a switch with a low voltage component. It has to be contacts. Okay. And watch your normally open and your normally closed. You're going to draw everything in the unpowered state. So however you draw your normally open and normally closed, your relay coil is not powered. So you're going to draw it in its normal position. Any other questions on that before I move on to thermostats? Negative. I'm good. Okay. Let us start talking a little bit about thermostats. Now, some of you guys have probably seen a similar thermostat presentation before. Okay, because we do have a tendency to talk about thermostats in every term. Okay, so this is something that some of you guys are seeing for the first time. Some of you have seen cooling thermostats. Some of you guys have seen heating thermostats. Some of you guys haven't seen thermostats before. So there is no question that is too, that is too simple to ask. Okay, you have to ask questions as we go through this. Okay. This is a typical oil furnace wiring diagram, okay? This is what you're going to see on an oil furnace when you open up the cover and look at the wiring diagram. Okay, this is why labeling becomes so important. Now, this wiring diagram, is it a, schema is it a ladder schematic or is it a pictorial? It's a pictorial. Yeah. So what, if you had to say the difference between a ladder diagram and a pictorial, what would it be? Ladder diagram looks like a ladder with no pictures, I guess. Okay, what if we said that a pictorial diagram is going to show you how to wire something, but a okay. ladder diagram is going to show you the sequence of operation? All right. Sense. Okay, so a pictorial 
This is a pictorial. It's going to show you what to connect where. In other words, down here, it's going to show you we have our thermostat pins on the board. This is a circuit board inside the furnace. And it's going to show you the dotted lines that is going to go to the thermostat. Okay? It's going to show you if you have air conditioning. It's going to show you the dotted lines that connect from Y and C to the outdoor unit, to the condenser. It's going to show you where your pit, where the dip switches are, so you can set different fan delays and stuff like that. So it's going to show you even where your line voltage is going. It's going to show you how to wire everything. It's not going to show you how everything sequences. That's why we use the ladder schematics. Ladder schematics are great for sequencing. The wiring diagram shows you how things are wired. Any questions between the two? Okay. There's two types of circuits that we've already started to talk about. We have a control system that are series and control a load. Then we have loads which are normally wired in parallel. The heating system has several levels of controls. We have the basics and then we go to more complex as the system gets more complex. Okay, in other words, you get a little bit of what you pay for. So the levels of controls that we see are split into, you have your basic on and off control. That's our thermostat and our switch, our basic on and off control. We have our safety controls, okay? This is like, do we have flame? Is the furnace overheating? Is the blower running? Okay, do we have proper ventilation? Those are our safety controls. In other words, safety controls have to be there so you don't burn down a house or kill somebody. Efficiency, which is basically comfort controls. This is start where you start getting into, okay, higher end equipment. So you have your basic units that have this type of controls, the basic on off and the safety. Then we add, based on how much the unit costs and the different features and the efficiencies, we add these additional controls. The most basic device for the heating, and cool, the heating system, also for the cooling system, is the thermostat. This is what the customer sees. This is where it all starts. The customer turns it down or up, the heat should come on. Okay, in most cases, our thermostat for oil is 24 volts. You rarely see a 120-volt oil thermostat. The only place I've really ever seen them is in a concrete factory that I did some work at for a while, a concrete manufacturing plant where they had oil furnaces as unit heaters. That's the little heaters that are hanging from the ceiling. Okay, they had little oil furnaces all over the place. That's the only place I've seen... 120 volt control thermostats on an oil furnace. We do see them as safeties. So remember, thermostats can also be used as safeties, but our control thermostat, the customer turns it on, the heat should come on. Okay, that starts with a 24 volt thermostat. Okay, it is also one of the most frequently changing devices in the HVAC industry. Okay, when I first went to school, some of the digital thermostats with, that we have today was someone's dream. Okay, now I can barely get a thermostat that's not digital. Okay, they're the most frequently changing device in the HVAC industry. Who on this call, if you want to say, still has a mercury thermostat in your home? One of the I little. Have, I still I have, have one. The circle ones that you got to turn in the basement. Yeah. In my basement. Yep. Yeah, they're still, still one. yeah, they're still out there, but can we buy them anymore to install them? In a lot of states, no. No, my dad's been trying to replace it down here because it's actually not really that functioning, but we can't find another one. Ah, you just go buy one. I'll show you the type you buy, a little snap action one. They're white. They're put out by Honeywell. No digital control. Still has the levers on it. It works the same. Okay, they do the same thing. It turns it on and turns it off at the proper temperature. What did they do before the days of thermostats? The levers. 
Someone Rose. actually had to sit there when they woke up in the morning. They turned the heat on for the day. To throw wood on the fire. <laughs> well, that too. But th before the days of the thermostat, it was all manual. The first oil furnaces that came out were manual. Okay? Somebody had to basically, the equivalent of throw wood on a fire. The basic function of the thermostat is to respond to a change in temperature by opening or closing a set of contacts. That's all we're doing with a thermostat. It's either on or off. Okay? It's a switching device. It is not a load. Does it have a component in it that's a load? Well, yeah, some of them do. We'll talk about that as we go on. Thermostats can be line voltage, they can be control voltage, or they can be what we call direct digital. Okay, another name for direct digital is DDC, direct digital controls. Okay, you see that in commercial, that's DDC. You see it in commercial buildings. Okay, line voltage thermostats, we don't see that often in oil heating. You see these more in refrigeration or electric baseboard heat. Control voltage, air conditioning, gas heating, oil heating, all of this has to do with control voltage. What's our control voltage in, in the HVAC industry? What's our volts, voltage? 24 volts. Now, the reality is, you're good. If you put a meter on a transformer that we use, it's going to get between 26 and 28. Okay, that's okay. If I just get 24 volts out of a transformer, I'm going to look at it replacing that transformer. Line voltage, used most often in electric heat and refrigeration. Okay, control voltage thermostats, used mainly in residential, small office, light commercial, even big rooftop units, we're still using control voltage, even though we're more and more moving to DDC. Okay, direct digital controls do not use 24 volts. Anybody know what they do use? 18. Some of them are 18. Some of them run on current rather than voltage. What's our other direct digital we see? Okay, who here knows computers really well? Knows the electronics in computers? No. Okay, plus or minus 5 volts. Direct current. Okay, plus or minus 5 volts direct current. So, direct digital controls don't all use one voltage or one standard. There's about four different standards out there made by four different companies, and they don't always play well together. Okay. They're most often used in large offices, commercial, or public buildings. Okay. At the end of the course, we may talk more about direct digital, but for the main idea of this course, we're discussing control voltage, which is low voltage thermostats, 24 volts is the standard. We have three types of sensing elements. Now, the sensing element is the controlling part of the thermostat. It's the part that moves and causes the contacts to close when the thermostat ch senses a change in temperature. Okay? Bimetal is something that you're going to hear me talk about over and over again. Bimetal. You have a piece of metal that might be copper. Okay? You have a piece of metal that might be bronze or brass. Okay, you sandwich these together in the manufacturing process. They're connected together. As temperature changes, metal expands and contracts. Okay, as one side of the metal expands greater than the other side of the metal, it will bend. Okay, because one side is going to expand greater than the other side, and these are relatively thin pieces of metal. So as the metal bends based on the heating or cooling movement, we can either move a mercury-filled capsule, we can push two contacts together, we can um, do just about anything else with these metals bending. If it's a coiled piece of metal that's bending, and I'll talk more about this, this coil is actually going to get wider or smaller based on the heat 
and based on how that metal is bending. Okay, so bimetal, two pieces of dissimilar metals that are wired together. They expand and contract at a different rate. Okay, that is the whole premise. That is our base design of any non-digital thermostat. Okay, there's two base, there's three basic elements here. Okay, we have the one that just looks, it's called cantilever because all it does is the, it starts bending as the, as it heats up. It bends in an upward direction or as it cools down, it bends in a downward direction. When we put our brass, when we put contacts here, we can make it open or close a set of contacts. We have U-shaped. Again, as this expands and contracts, it's going to change the shape and it's going to pull the bottom up or down. Again, if this is a set of contacts, I can close a set of contacts by the U-shaped. We also have spiral. This is what's in a lot of your mercury thermostats. The mercury bulb is mounted on here. Okay, and has a little ball of mercury that floats around in there. Okay, as this opens and closes based on the heating and cooling of the bimetal, that mercury is going to float around and close contacts between two sets of small wires that's inside the bulb. Now, mercury is a hazardous material, so we really don't want to put it in houses anymore. There's been too many instances where the thermostats have been broken, either on purpose or accidentally. Drop the little ball of mercury on the floor and kids pick it up. Well, there's some adults that have picked it up as well, but we're more worried about the kids, okay? And it is a very toxic substance, okay? The movement of the bimetal, as I just showed you, the contacts move a mercury bulb or bring a magnet on the contact together. Now, whatever way we use of closing the contacts, it has to have a good, solid connection. We don't want the contacts, let's say we have two contacts out here, okay? We don't want the contacts to be bouncing together, okay? In other words, we don't want them to like, okay, well, maybe I should be open or maybe I should be closed. They have to have a good, solid way of getting together. That's called snap acting, okay? They pull together and they're closed until they pull apart. There's no bouncing around of these things. Okay, snap acting. The first type of thermostat we have is called a remote bulb thermostat. Okay, we have a thermostat dial in one place, and we have a capillary tube connecting it from one place to another. So in other words, I might have a remote, I might have my dial in one location, and I might have a capillary tube that runs to a bulb filled with a substance, okay? So this is in the space I want to condition. Okay, we use these when we start talking about boilers. Okay, we use these a lot on hot water heating systems. That's why we even bring them up in here. The material that's in here expands and contracts and opens or closes a set of contacts. We have solid state also. Solid state is our digital or programmable thermostat. They use a solid state control. Okay, it uses a material that changes resistances based on temperature. Knowing the resistance, the thermostat can judge and display what the correct temperature is. Supposedly, they have a longer and more accurate lifespan. I sometimes question the accurate lifespan, but they have no moving parts. So digital thermostats, there's a little sensor in it, looks like a little resistor or sometimes a little diode that you can sometimes see if you look under the cover of a digital thermostat. It might be on the circuit board, it might be by itself. That actually changes resistance based on the room temperature. Now if I have a customer who's always cold, and if I verify the thermostat is working correctly, and if I, they don't want to turn up the temperature on the thermostat, I can sometimes, through the installer commands, I can actually say, always display a temperature that's two or three degrees warmer than the room temperature. So I have some programming options on the room temperature of the digital thermostats. Okay, Di digital thermostats accuracy 
if they're battery operated, the accuracy of the digital thermostat is dependent on the batteries. I'm going to say that again. If you have a digital thermostat that is only operating on battery, okay, in other words, it doesn't have complete power hooked up to it, it doesn't have a C terminal, okay, and I'll show you the pin, the wiring diagram in a few minutes. But if it doesn't have a C terminal, it's dependent on battery operation. As the batteries get weaker, the, di the display will no longer be accurate. So you got to watch those low battery indicators on these thermostats. Okay, I'm going to say the same thing about your voltage meters. Your meters you have, as those batteries start to get weaker, their readings are not as accurate as they were with, with um, new batteries. Be careful about that. But digital thermostats, no moving parts. Every heating anticipator or every heating thermostat has a heating anticipator. It's part of the wiring and part of the control circuit of the thermostat. When a furnace is warming up in a room after the thermostat calls for heat, the temperature of the room continues to drop. Okay, in other words, the, fur the, the furnace calls for heat the furnace is warming up. The temperature continues to drop in the space because we're not blowing heat into the space anymore. The other issue is that once the heating cycle is over, the furnace holds a lot of heat and will continue to provide heat to the space as it cools down. Okay, this is called overshoot. Okay, it's going to overshoot the temperature of the room. So in other words, my set point temperature, let's say I have my setting set for 70 degrees, okay? We want the room temperature to be as close to 70 degrees as we can have it. But we know that with normal operation, the furnace is going to come on when the temperature goes under 70 degrees, and then we will overshoot that's 70 degrees by the time the blower shuts off when the furnace is cool. Okay, we may not have the flame running this whole time, but that furnace is going to overshoot that 70 degrees. So the room's going to feel a little bit warmer. It might go up to 72 degrees or 73. Then it's going to drop back down to 70. Our thermostat is going to call for heat, but the temperature may continue to drop a few degrees before that furnace starts providing heat and goes back up again. So we use a heating anticipator to try to prevent this overshoot and the drop. Okay, basically a heating anticipator is a resistor. Okay, it's a small resistor built into a thermostat that generates some heat during the call for heat. The bimetal element senses this additional heat and causes the thermostat to shut off a little bit before the room temperature is satisfied. Okay, so additional heat is generated. It shuts off a little bit before the room temperature is satisfied. So if I would draw this whole idea out quickly, okay, on a really bad drawing of a schematic, we have my resistor. We have my heating thermostat. Okay. And this is my R terminal of my thermostat. I'll talk more about terminals in a minute. This is my W terminal. This goes out to my heating equipment, whatever I've connected to it, like my oil primary or heat relay. This is my heat anticipator. Okay, it's part of the thermostat. So when there's a call for heat, my thermostat closes, and my heating anticipator is actually in series with, the, with whatever I'm powering. Now this heating anticipator is adjustable. Okay, this heating anticipator is an adjustable resistor. The adjustment has amperage readings on it. 
Okay, so you look at the adjustment, it may be like 0.4 amps, 0.6 amps. It has numbers on it that are amperage readings. The heating anticipator, and I think I say it later in this PowerPoint, is always adjusted to the amperage of whatever control it's powering. So in like a, in an oil furnace, it would be adjusted to the amperage of the primary control circuit, and it will say it right on the primary control. Okay, if the, and we haven't talked about primary controls yet, other than I pointed it out on a burner the other day. If you're on any system, the heating anticipator has to be set to the amperage of the primary control. What this does, it makes sure that both devices are getting proper power when the thermostat is closed. Because I have two loads now. Let's say there's a relay over here. I have two loads in series. I have my anticipator and I have my relay. They are both in series. Any questions on that? Negative. Okay, so basically, as this, as this resistor generates a little bit of heat, okay, it's going to provide additional heat to the thermostat itself, to the bimetal in the thermostat, and it's going to allow it to satisfy a little bit earlier. It sort of fakes it out and says, okay, my room's warmer than it seems. And that's because the blower is going to continue to run, and it's going to shut down that furnace a little bit at a higher temperature, okay, because we have to get the heat out of the furnace, or we're going to have mechanical problems with the furnace eventually. The whole purpose of the heating anticipator is that it allows the remaining heat in the furnace or water, if we're dealing with a boiler, to be released into the room while preventing the heat from over, the room from overheating. Solid state digital thermostats do not have an adjustable anticipator. They're part of the digital thermostat. It's self-adjusting. Okay, in adjustable thermostats, basically, just as I said, have to be set to the amperage of the gas valve or heating relay. By heating relay, in oil, we are talking the primary control, or in a boiler, it might be the zone valve. Okay, it's whatever's controlling our heating. The anticipator must be set to the amperage of that device. Again, this is just a more of a pictorial diagram. Okay, when this is mounted on a wall, it's actually going to be tilted that way. So the heating anticipator is actually under the bimetal because heat rises. The heating anticipator is only powered when the system is in heating mode and calling for heat. Okay, again, only powered when it's in heating mode and calling for heat. If the setting of the heating anticipator is too low, okay, if it's not set properly, if the amperage is too low, it's going to cycle. It's going to cycle more frequently. In other words, it's going to anticipate much more frequently than it needs to. Your heat's going to come on and off more often, and it's not going to be, it's going to have very small temperature swings. It's going to have a tendency to droop or stay below the settings. Okay, your room will feel colder and will be measured at a cooler temperature than what your thermostat is set, because it's never going to keep up properly. If the setting is too high, your cycles are going to be too long. You're going to have very wide temperature swings, okay? There's going to be very wide temperature swings, okay? It's going to have a tendency to a little bit lag behind what the thermostat says. And I'll show this on the next slide because I actually have a graph that shows it to you. Can these measure humidity as well? Thermostats don't measure humidity unless they're digital and have a separate humidity sensor. Okay, there's, these are measuring sensible heat, which is just the heat I can measure without taking humidity into account. Okay. Now, that's not to say that some thermostats don't have a separate sensor. Okay, but we're not going to worry about it with anticipators. Those are specifically looking at humidity, which is a very important to also look at, but that's digital. Okay. 
This would be a comparison of room temperature with and without anticipation. Line number one, my flat line across that runs at 70, basically 72 degrees straight across my chart here. Okay, signified by the number one. That is my set point. My thermostat is set for 72 degrees. If I do not have room temperature or anticipation, we're going to have this very wide line. Okay, it's going to be pretty going pretty far below and pretty far over what my thermostat set point is. Okay, if I have the heating anticipator, you're going to see a more frequent cycle, but it's going to pull it closer to the set point. Okay, so the room will feel more comfortable to the occupants. What demographic is really, actually, what two demographics are really, really um, sensitive to heat and cool? Feeling hot and cool. What two demographics of people? Like what kinds of, like what type of people are you hearing? Young and old. Yeah. We are younger or older or male or female. Which are your two demographics that are very sensitive to heat and cool? Older people and older people. The elderly. The elderly are very sensitive to being cold. They can deal with heat more easily unless they're on oxygen. If they're on oxygen, they sense heat. they tend to overheat as well. But they're very sensitive to cold. Okay, and they're going to be the ones complaining if they're if they get these cold feelings. Women are also much more sensible to heat or cool, and you're going to get a lot of complaints in an office environment if the temperatures lag too low, okay, for too long. So those are your two populations that you're going to get the most complaints from if the heating anticipator isn't working properly. And these do go out after a while. Just like any piece of equipment, the heating anticipator does go out. It's a very fine wire, very small resistor, and it will burn out eventually. Thermostat safety, a couple things that I have to say on this because it's so important. Know what voltage it controls. Okay? Don't put the wrong thermostat on the wrong voltage. I have seen people do this, okay? You can actually have a thermostat that you've hung up on a wall inside someone's living room. You go down to the basement, turn the switch back on in the equipment, and you hear the scream from upstairs from the homeowner as they start seeing smoke rolling out of the thermostat. Don't do that. Know the voltage, okay? Don't touch a broken mercury thermostat. It's an environmental waste, and it can burn you severely. Okay, you can sometimes pick up mercury by using two pieces of paper and then enclosing it in a piece of paper and taking it back to your company's warehouse. And they actually, most of them, most companies have a mercury container where it's actually all the old mercury thermostats are put for environmental disposal. Okay, you don't want to just toss these in the trash either. Okay, there's too many consequences that can happen. Not to mention if you get caught, you get a severe fine. But don't touch mercury. No matter what thermostat you have, the basic principles in the wiring are all the same. This is a basic wiring diagram of a thermostat. Okay, you're going to have four basic terminals. Okay, we have an R. Okay, might or might not have a red wire on it. The R terminal is my 24 volt feed from my transformer. We have a W terminal. W stands for white. It might or might not actually have a white wire on it. Okay, but it's my heating terminal. It goes to whatever my source of heat is. Could be the oil burner primary control, could be a zone valve on a boiler could be anything that's controlling my heat. The Y terminal is my cooling terminal. We talk more about that when we're talking about our air conditioning term. That goes to my condenser outside, the outside unit of my air conditioning. A G terminal 
okay, controls my fan if I have a separate fan switch for a high-speed fan. In other words, if your thermostat has a fan on or fan auto switch, there is a G terminal on it. That's normally a green wire, but don't count on it anymore. Wire colors are no longer as important as what they connect to. Used to be that G was for green, and some techs knew it actually controlled the fan. R was for red. Some techs knew that it was the 24-volt source. Y used to be for yellow, and it always had a yellow wire on it. W always had a white wire on it. That's no longer the case. As thermostats and everything has become more and more complicated, we sometimes do not see the wire colors that you think belong on it. So I have a, if I have a black and a red wire on a black and red insulated wire on my G terminal, as long as it connects to the G terminal on the equipment, I'm fine. Okay, so you won't always see G for green, R for red, Y for yellow, W for heat. Those are the standards, but as wire changes, as wire availability changes, so does the wire color that's used. As long as R goes to R, Y goes to Y, we're fine. The electric flow, the electrons flowing in that wire don't know what color it is, nor do they care. Basic terminals of a thermostat. You guys have to know these. Okay? You have to know these. R is my 24 volts for my thermostat, for my transformer. W is my heating. Y is my cooling. G is my fan or indoor blower. C is common from the transformer. It's not always there. O is a reversing valve designation. Y2 and W2 is second stage heating or cooling for high efficiency systems and a lot of times used in commercial. We may have a first stage of heating that works like in my sort of my seasonal like fall and spring type weathers where you don't need the full power of heating. You don't need the full BTUs that can be made. So we energize heating at a slightly lower flame, slightly less oil, slightly less air. Then we turn on W2 if it cannot maintain temperature based on that. Outside temperature drops, we turn on W2. We pull in the full force of the oil burner. We put, add air for combustion air. We add oil for more fuel, and we basically make the furnace work at peak efficiency or boiler at peak efficiency. So again, those are the more expensive, more economic systems. We have two stages of heating. You see it more often in gas equipment than you do in oil, but it is out there in oil. You see it on boilers as well. But you guys do have to know these, di these designations. There's really no way to memorize these other than sitting there and memorizing them, okay? Because if I'm an interviewer someplace in the future, if I was a service manager interviewing a technician, one of my first trade-related questions is going to be, what does the G terminal of the thermostat connect to? Why do I like that question so much? What's, what's so important about the G designation? Because that's what uh, pushes the cool or hot air into your house. Probably one of the most common fixes and problems. What else uses a green wire? Ground. 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 Yeah, that's uh, why I like that question so much. A true technician knows almost in his sleep that a G wire on the low voltage side of a system, in other words, off of a thermostat, does not go to ground. Okay, you'd be surprised how many people who are trying to get their first job, and I get feedback from the employers on this so I know what's going on. You'd be surprised how many uh, people graduating from school who go for their first interview and the employer asks them, what's the G-terminal on the thermostat go to? You'd be surprised how many people say ground. Wow. Okay, please. G on a low-voltage side of a system does not go to ground. 
it goes to the fan relay from the thermostat. Controls the indoor blower. Okay, happens very frequently. Okay, so know these diagrams, flashcards, having your kids quiz you, stuff like that is awesome for this. Okay, thermostats have many different wiring diagrams. Okay, as I'm going to show you a few, but still have the same basic functions. Okay, easiest way to find the, out what the terminals on a thermostat do, look at the manual. Okay, look at the wiring diagrams. This is another wiring diagram. Does anybody see my RW um, G designations here? No. Okay. So if you just saw X, if you just looked at the terminals on the subplate and just saw these designations, okay, you might actually completely wire a thermostat wrong. Okay, because you might not have what it goes to right there on the sub-base of the thermostat. The only way you're going to figure this out is to either look extremely closely to see where the wires go on the thermostat itself, or go find the manual. Okay, thankfully, these de designations are on much older thermostats, and you may not be seeing them in the field anymore. Okay, but occasionally you still come up with a really old thermostat. you got to figure out what it is. Okay, look at the manual. Okay, this is a control connection. For a typical, this is more for, you see it on the control side. Okay, again, you might have C1, H1, F, X1, and X2. Okay, that's your pins on the thermostat. You've got to find the manual someplace to find out that H1 is my W1. F is my G. X1 is R. X2, even though it isn't designated as anything, it's my C terminal. It's common. Okay, so again, the designations on the thermostat sometimes do not make sense. Okay, the other thing you're going to see often, and this is in a lot of manuals regarding when you start talking about direct digital controls, you're going to see the flow chart type looking thing. Okay, there's a microprocessor in the middle, okay, that takes the temperature measurement, takes your user inputs, this is the homeowner or business owner hitting up or down on the thermostat, and the display, all of that's controlled by a microprocessor. And then you have an interface that connects to the equipment. These may be completely different components. The temperature measurement might be a remote sensor out someplace in the room. The display might be a computer terminal in, a, in the um, operations office. User inputs might be a remote that maybe the technician who's responsible for that building has in the field. They might be the only one authorized to change the equipment. The electronic microprocessor might be a building control system. The interface circuitry is a circuit board that's mounted in the equipment. So all of this, as you start getting in more complicated systems, okay, builds a lot into the controls, okay? Controls, the control side of air conditioning and heating and HVAC in general is a great side of the industry to get into. Okay, a lot of good opportunities there, a lot of good money there. What do you think you need to really understand for the control side of the industry? What's the pri what do you have to really understand on the control side of the industry? Anybody? Terminals. Terminals is one thing. What else? Uh, electronics. Wiring. Yeah, uh, electronics. Yup. What else? I heard somebody say something. Wiring. Wiring. 
does it help to have some? Does it help to either want to learn or have a computer background? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You'd be surprised about the technicians that I'm finding that are doing the best in the control industry right now. They're the gamers. Okay, those are the technicians that I'm finding that are doing the best. Why do they do so well when you're dealing with controls? Because they build their own computers. Some of that. What about logic and thinking? They're used to the technology, so they're just exposed to it more. Yeah, and again, there's a logic in thinking when you're playing a game. The games you know, that they play, that they need to have specific little things in them. You get a yeah. strategy, you know. Yep. It all all builds together in control technicians. Now, all of these, all of this is learnable, but you gotta learn schematics. You gotta learn wiring. Now, can a control technician not have not understand how the equipment works also? Sure. A good control technician has to know how the equipment functions. Yeah. Because you're the one responsible for um cycling the equipment. Okay, you're the one who's responsible for making sure everything runs safely. So you actually have to understand the entire process. But I'm going to tell you right now, control technicians do very well financially. Okay, and it all starts with the operation of the thermostat. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Nope. Negative, sir. Okay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fan centers. Nice. Okay. A lot of people over the years that I've seen working in the shops, in the, in the labs and everything like that, have a tendency to look at the fan center and, for lack of better language, think, oh, shit. Okay, the reality is that the fan centers are really not something to worry that much about. We've already talked about both components that are on a fan center. Okay, a fan center is simply a transformer and a relay. Okay, we have our transformer up, up at the top of the fan center, or depending on how you look at it, it might be at the bottom. These can be mounted in any direction. I have my transformer. And I have a relay that's plugged into a receptacle. It's a little Mars relay. Okay? All a fan center does is actually make it easier for the technician because the transformer and the relay are actually pre-wired so that all you have to do is connect some line voltage wiring that's in the back and all your control voltage goes here. And I'll get more into this, but if you look closely at this, before I change the slide, you have your R, C, W, G, and Y terminals right there. Okay, so your entire bundle of thermostat wire comes directly to the fan center. Okay, and all the functionality you need to control heating and cooling is right here on the fan center as long as you wire it properly. And since they actually give you the letter designations of what you're wiring, there's really no reason for you not to wire properly. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at the fan center. What it's designed to do is it provides low voltage control of blower motors and other circuits. Has anybody seen a house recently that has oil, forced air, heat that doesn't have air conditioning? Yes, actually. Okay. You have two options when you want to install air conditioning into that environment. Okay. 
you have an option. You just replace the entire oil furnace with one that's designed with the controls to do air conditioning as well, or you add a fan center. Okay, because heating, the blower on the heating side of things is controlled by the temperature of the furnace. But I have to be able to turn on that fan in cooling mode, which obviously will be a very low temperature with comparison to the temperature of that furnace. So I have to be able to move air in the cooling mode, okay, without bringing the furnace on because there's no sense in running your air conditioning and your heat together. So by adding a fan center, I have the ability to control my fan, the indoor blower, from both a heating mode, which is what we're going to primarily talk about this term, but also a cooling mode. Why does an oil burner technician need to understand fan centers? Because you're going to see it on equipment and you have to be able to troubleshoot around it. And also, if you work for a company that does both, it doesn't help you it doesn't hurt you to understand what a fan center is. By the way, I use fan centers on a lot of other things than just furnaces. Okay, we use them a lot in boilers as well. So we'll talk more about this whole idea when we talk about hydronics. The fan center contains a low voltage transformer. Steps down from 120 to 24. And again, that could be 26 to 28, okay? But 24 is the official designation. It's a pre-wired multifunction switching relay. has a normally open and a normally closed. It has a low voltage terminal board. Okay, I showed you that on the picture we started off with. Fan centers can be used when there's two transformers, one on the heating equipment side and one on the cooling equipment. The transformers have to be isolated from each other based on whether the thermostat is in the heating mode or the cooling mode. Now, I can't switch to it right now, but think about, um, think about whether the transformer in an oil furnace. We haven't talked much about it, but I showed you a primary control. That primary control contains a heating transformer. It's not going to do you any good if we have a cooling system also with that furnace. That's why we add the fan center. Gives us a second transformer for the air conditioning side of the equipment. Now, why do you need to know this for an oil system? They have to be isolated. These two transformers should never be wired together. If you wire two transformers together in the incorrect way, okay, you can actually double your voltage and you'll burn out anything connected to it. And it usually burns out in style. Okay, the connections from a fan center, they sort of match the connections I told you you need to know on the thermostat. R, W, G, Y, and C. Okay, they usually match. And it's very easy. We take a thermostat from the R wire, we take a wire from the thermostat R terminal connected to R. W to W. G to G, Y to Y, and C to C if there's one over on the thermostat. All of this is set up so the wires go from point to point. Very difficult to mess up. During a call for heat, the normally closed relay contact, and I'll show you this on a diagram in a minute, stays closed and the blower is controlled by the fan limit switch, that's the heat sensitive switch I showed you briefly on a diagram yesterday, okay, which is mounted in the furnace plenum. So this is on a call for heat. The low speed blower motor winding is connected to here through the fan limit switch, which is my temperature sensitive switch that closes as the furnace gets hot. That goes to blower. Okay, that's normally closed. So if this fails, it always fails in the heating position. The black wire goes to my high-speed blower motor directly. Notice there's no thermostat in there. So anytime we energize the coil, this is going to close. That's going to open. And it's going to energize my black, my high-speed blower motor. These two wires here 
are connected together to line. Okay, this is connected to line. That's connected to neutral. And then the rest of these connect into my thermostat. The W and the Y is a junction point. In other words, it doesn't do anything on the fan relay, but it allows us to junction the wires coming from the thermostat to wires going someplace else. Okay? Any questions on that? No, sir. Anybody else? Any questions? No. Okay. Drina call for cooling. The thermostat closes R to G, which energizes the relay coil. When the coil is energized, the normally open contact closes, and it allows the blower to operate at high speed. Okay. So again, call for cooling. I'm energizing G. Okay, so I've made a connection. G to R over in the thermostat. There's a switch. I energize this coil. This closes. That opens. I now have my line voltage coming through my black wire, and these are standard wire colors most often, and it goes to my high speed of my blower. On any motor, some of you may not know this, some of you do know this. It's okay if you don't, we haven't talked about motors yet. But for those who do know, can I energize two windings of my motor together? No. 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 What happens? I think a short. Yeah, the motor's going to short out. So I can never provide power through two windings of a motor at the same time. Okay, through like a high and a low speed. I can provide power through a start winding, which we'll talk about again. We're going to start talking a little bit about motors tomorrow. But I cannot provide two speed windings, like a low, high, low, medium, Okay, medium, medium, high. I can't provide two speed windings with voltage at the same time. Okay, the motor's going to burn out. And again, it usually does it with some smoke involved. Okay. The, the W, the Y, and any additional terminals are just junction points. So again, if I go back to my schematic diagram of this whole thing, okay, this is probably one of the most, I don't expect you to memorize this diagram, but I need you to understand what is in a fan center. It's a normally open, normally closed Mars relay. It has the coil. So everything here is my relay component. Everything here is my transformer. And then I just have a circuit board with the appropriate pins already pre-wired. Easy enough? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so fan centers just gives you something that's one component that we can use, and we don't only, you can use this any place in the field where you need a transformer and a relay. Okay, again, I use these a lot when we start talking about oil boilers and stuff like that. Fan centers are awesome. They're, they're a great switching relay and a voltage source. Okay. So, again, it's not just used on an oil furnace being converted to air conditioning. You'll see these elsewhere. Any questions on anything I've covered today? Because I did cover quite a bit with thermostats. I did cover quite a bit with fan centers. Tomorrow, we're going to start using all of this. Okay, we're going to start talking about it, how it works in schematics. We're going to start talking about it, how it brings things together. And we're just going to start adding some motors and stuff like that to our schematics. Okay, any questions on anything that I need to answer for you guys? 
Um, I went to review yesterday's class, and I think you might have posted the mornings and ours. Did I? I'll go back and check. Oops. Thank you. Hey, whenever you hit that sit, if I do that again, because I've done that before and I apologize, when it, that happens, just send me an email or a text message that same day, and I'll I'll go fix that. Okay. Yes, yeah, no problem. Okay. Anyone else? Nope. I'm good. Nope. Okay. Well, I'm ending a little bit early today, but I really don't want to dig into schematics before tomorrow. So you guys have a great rest of the day, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. You as well. All right. See you. All right. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Have a good see day. Ya. See you. Deuces.